the recording. Great. Uh, and uh, great. So um, it's great to have um, Eric Katz back uh, uh, to speak. He, uh, he's cur uh, currently from Ohio State University, but long before many of you were born, he, uh, and he was at Stanford, uh, and he's going to tell us about iterated piatic integration on semi-stable curves. Okay, I'd like to thank Robbie for inviting me, and I'm glad to be back, and everything I say is going to be joint work with Daniel Litt. So this is gonna be about iterated piatic integration, but I'm gonna talk about ordinary piatic integration first. And the setting is gonna be the following. I'm gonna have a proper algebraic curve defined over a finite extension of the piatic rationals. And the question is, can I integrate one forms on the curve? And, and let's just say regular one forms, that makes perfect sense. And I would like to define these line integrals along paths it's unclear whether path makes sense. Uh, All right, so. Is the curve smooth or do we not care? What's that? Is the curve smooth or do we not care? Oh, uh, oops, yeah, let's make it smooth. Okay, so let's start off by doing the dumb thing, which is just term by term integration. So we're gonna, hunt for a primitive um, whose differential is omega. And then, so just try to anti-differentiate. And so, we so, can, so, so far we've got no, we have no idea what gamma means, what a path means, but we should just not. Right, it. just enjoy the ride for now. Um, I will define a path. And in a lot of cases, path won't matter. Everything will be path independent. Um, so given a point, I can define a residue disk around it. And that means in a certain in a certain sense, points a distance less than one from X or points specializing to the same point mod P as X. And that actually is parameterized by a disk, which means I can express my one form as a power series, and then I can integrate it term by term. And for those of you who aren't used to thinking piatically, um, integrating term by term isn't so innocent because like the convergence won't get too messed up, but we're dividing by n plus one, which isn't, n plus one is not necessarily big because if n plus one is divisible by p, p inverse is big. So the coefficients can be bigger and you have, and so you have to. It shouldn't, it shouldn't change the radius of convergence, though. It just makes it, it on an open radius. disk. If you've got a closed disk, you have to make it slightly bigger. Oh, also, okay. Arnold, okay. Well, it's the same radius, though. Yeah. Right. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Ah. Right. Yeah. You just have to worry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If you've got a closed disk, you have to worry slightly. Also, Arnav points out that that inequality, both sides are the same. Yes, thank you. Oh, it's, uh, a, true it's a true statement, except for that. Mm. Yes. Okay. And I gave like the the beginning of this talk is adapted from a talk for, from grad students, and I didn't pick up any students by giving that talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, this is like the issue of convergence is pretty minor. Um, but there's a bigger problem, which is that X is totally disconnected. So I can integrate omega on a disk, do it on every disk, but I can't match constants of integration between disks because I can't analytically continue. So we're gonna resolve this issue. And I'm gonna start with one resolution, which is classical. Um, I don't, like certainly Shabati had this understood this in the 1940s. And this is what I call abelian integration. So given a base point on the curve, I define the Abel Jacobi map from X to its Jacobian. And this can be done purely algebraically due to like results of A and others. And something that's slightly surprising is that if I treat the Jacobian as a piatic Lie group, the logarithm map is globally defined. Like usually you expect it, you know, only to be defined in around the origin. And 
The reason why is I can integrate, I can form the log locally around the identity by a power series argument. So this should be familiar from the theory of like uh, formal groups. But since the FP bar points, the group of FP bar points of the Jacobian is torsion, um, given any other point, there's some power of it that gets arbitrarily close to the origin. So I can define log by taking some, pow some power of the point in the group law, some multiple of the point in the group log, take its log and divide by n. Okay, now this original function, this log that I defined around the identity ends up being analytic, but this extension is only locally analytic. It's not globally analytic and it can't possibly be globally analytic. All right, now, so I've defined this log map on the Jacobian and I know the Lie algebra of the Jacobian is dual to the one forms, the global one forms. So I can form the following composition. So I start off my curve, I take its Jacobian, I take it to its Jacobian by the Abel Jacobian map, I take its log, which lands in the Lie algebra, and then I pair with omega, which lands in CP. And if we were in the classical world and we're arbitrarily close to the identity, this composition by the, how you classically define the Jacobian would be the, the following indefinite integral. And, but this makes sense globally, so I can define integration between two points like this. So I just go from P to Y minus from P to X. And now we get the first surprising fact that this is actually path independent. So you end up defining a global function. And that seems wrong because our one form omega should represent a non-trivial Durham class. So it shouldn't be exact. Well, it isn't exact because we don't have an analytic primitive. But, and this function is all sorts of pathological. Like for instance, you a priori, you can't constrain its zeros the way you can for an analytic function. But you'd also expect there to be periods. And the reason why there's not is because our target field CP is not a sensitive enough field. It's not something that periods want to land in. And Colmez enlarged this theory, this abelian theory that I'm talking about to have target Fontaine's period rings. So there is, if you replace CP with like B Chris or BST, um, there is a good integration theory that has legitimate periods. And if you stare at what Colmez did, it's a rephrasing of comparison theorems in Piatic Hodge theory. Although, so, so, Eric, to make sure I understand, you're saying that if we, so in the case of CP, then, then that's good. We can integrate, uh, but uh, we don't have periods. And if we want periods, we can't integrate yet. We can't right, right. Right. But I won't. Um, I'm only going to tell about tell you about a very impoverished theory of periods. Right. So I'm not going to go into these deeper periods. I thought quite a bit about them, but I and I could talk about that afterwards. But I haven't written them up, that up. Um, okay. So now, now there's a problem with these integrals. <laughs> is that you? Would you guys stop? Um, <laughs> is you can't compute them got a discipline problem at home. Um, like this whole construction isn't local on the curve. You need to, the Abel Jacobi map. And like these, the construction of the Jacobian and the Abel Jacobi map is extremely inexplicit. And you'd actually want to compute these. So here are some reasons why you would. Um, you, there's a Shabbati method for explicitly identifying rational points. So, Suppose X is defined over the rationals and the mordel vey theorem says that the group of rational points is, finitely is a finitely generated abelian group. And I'm gonna define the mordel vey rank to be the rank of the rational points. And if, and if we base our Abel Jacobi map on a rational point, the logarithm of the rational points lies in a vector subspace of dimension at most the Mordell-Vey rank. And now the Jacobian is of genus G, 
or sorry, is, a, is G dimensional. So if the word L of A rank is less than G, then the rational points lie in a proper subspace. So we can find a one form whose integral vanishes on all rational points. And then using some estimates for the zeros of the primitive in a residue disk, we can get bounds on the number of rational points. This is Coleman's explicit Chabati method. And the way it works is you, you basically sacrifice that there's a rational point in every residue disk, and then you use a Newton polygon argument to bound the number of zeros in each residue disk and a tiny bit of degree theory. And you and because you integrate, you have to worry about like catastrophes where you integrate in your coefficients, p-adic valuation changes, like I was showing earlier. So usually you just mandate that the that your prime p be bigger than the genus. And then the estimates work. If not, there's a correction term that's not so bad. All right. And then another reason why you might be interested is torsion points. So we can look at the torsion points of the Jacobian and we can pull those points back by the Abel Jacobi map. And that's what I call, that's what you call the torsion points of the curve. And then this log map has target a torsion free group. So the logarithm the, of the torsion points is zero. So that tells us that any integral vanishes on all the torsion points. So you could try understanding those zeros. So this is a lot of what Coleman did in the 1980s, like these applications but you need something more local than the Sibelian theory. And so Coleman's approach was to analytically continue the integrals by Frobenius. So this is the Dwork trick. And here's a wonderful quote by Dwork. Rigid analysis was, provide, was created to provide some coherence in an otherwise totally disconnected piatic realm. Still, it is often left to Frobenius to quell the rebellious outside prom, outer provinces. Okay, so what, all right, how does Frobenius help us? So if your curve X has good reduction, I've got a Frobenius on the reduction mod P. And then if I remove some disks from my curve on the remaining open set, I can extend Frobenius. So in other words, I can define a Frobenius on this remaining open that restricts to Frobenius on the reduction. And this helps us to find integrals by forcing what the constant of integration is, by giving a, making the theory more global. And the way it would work is the following. So I'm gonna take as axiomatic that a reasonable integration theory should have a good change of variables formula. Excuse me. Oh yeah. Sorry, so, um, quick question. Um, sure. I'm sorry for interrupting, but um, so you're assuming good reduction here. Um, is good reduction needed to define abelian integrals or are no. they defined no matter what? No, they're defined defined unconditionally. Okay, so in your definition of log, where you look at the torsionness of the Jacobian of the reduction, yeah, um, that still works out? That's, yeah, that still works out because like if you have, yeah, because like it's still gonna be a group over FP over some, ex any point is gonna belong to some group over some finite extension of FP. Okay. So it's still gonna be a finite group. So you can out conduct anything into the Jacobian. Thank you. Sure. Good question. All right. And we'll talk about how things differ in the bad reduction case. So the method I'm about to tell you becomes pathological in a certain sense in the bad reduction case. Okay. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the change of variables formula um, using the Frobenius. So given a point, I'm gonna look at its reduction. And if it has coordinates in FP, then the image of that point under the lift of Frobenius is in the same residue disk of, as X. So I can integrate between X and its Frobenius image. If that's not true, I can just start hitting it with powers of Frobenius and find, you know, just based on what uh, the field of definition of the reduction. So, So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the change of variables formula, and I need to understand what happens when I pull back omega by Frobenius. 
So I pick a basis for my Duran cohomology of U and Frobenius acts on that cohomology. And so I'm gonna represent the action of the, of the Frobenius and cohomology by matrix M. And that means the following, if I take my vector of one forms or my vector of cohomology classes and I lift them to one forms, I can write the action of Frobenius, I hit it with a matrix times this same vector of one forms, and then I get off by exact one forms. And now I'm supposing P and FP are in the same residue disk and Q and FQ. So let me rewrite the integral from FP to FQ for omega. So I use change of variables. Then I integrate the right-hand side of this guy. So I get M times the integral from P to Q, like, and this means really the vector of one forms plus the difference of the vector of functions. All right, so that means I express this guy in terms of the original integral omega. So now, but I'm gonna rewrite this in a different way by integrating from FP to P, then P to Q, and then Q to FQ. And so when I, and so I got this term again. So let's isolate this term. So I have the identity minus the Frobenius matrix is equal to something that I can compute. And so then if I could just invert this matrix, I would be done. But I can, because this is a matrix for Frobenius, and then acting on the first Aram cohomology, my curve, and it's on a curve minus some disks. So by the vague conjectures, I know it's all weight one and two. So I avoid unit eigenvalues. So I can invert this matrix and I can solve for the integral. And this, it, okay, this is like a very sneaky trick. This is like. It's a great trick. Yeah, so, oh, and this exposition is borrowed from Balakrishnan, Bradshaw, Kedlaya. And this technique itself, like it's very close to what Coleman did, but the, like the exposition and the which is, is similar to uh, Kedlaya's point counting argument, like point counting on hyperelliptic curves. And anyway, this gives a local description of the integral of omega. We can get explicit estimates. Um, there are a lot of algorithms that exist now, and I'm gonna hype Jennifer Balakrishnan's work. All right, so now let's talk about bad reduction curves. And when I say good reduction or bad reduction, I mean potential good reduction or potential bad reduction, which means um, whether or not you have good or bad reduction over some, ex whether there's some extension, whether you possibly have good reduction. So your potentially bad reduction if you can't find a smooth model over some extension. But you can still achieve a semi-stable um, reduction. And that means essentially that you can find a smooth model such that the reduction has nodal singularities. I'm slightly lying here, but that's how we should think about it. So we've gotten at worst nodal singularities. And everything I talked about with abelian integrals still works. And then the question is whether Coleman integrals work. And the answer is kinda. So if X is bad reduction, we don't have a lift of Frobenius. We can pick local lifts. There's still a Frobenius action on cohomology. You can think that this is, comes out of the crystalline perspective, although it's much more hands-on than that. Um, but so there is an action of Frobenius on cohomology, but it's got uh, unit eigenvalues. So this matrix won't be invertible. All right, so let's do the next best thing, which is just work with what we can do. So what we can do is we can cover our curve by annuli and open sets that can be embedded in good reduction curves. So what you should think about is I've got a semi-stable model and let's say I, I want to integrate within this component. Well, this component um, in the reduction can be embedded into a good reduction curve. 
or there's a good that in this good reduction curve has an analytic embedding into my original curve. So I can do the integral like around here. So I can do it around each component. Oh yeah, and I should say that I call these Berkovich Coleman integrals. So Berkovich has a book on the theory of such integrals and he generalizes to higher dimensions. Um, although the, a lot of these notions appear in a paper of Coleman and de Chalit. All right, and here is the dual graph for this reduction. And then what I do is I piece the integrals together um, using the following formula on annuli. If I restrict my one form to an annulus, it's going to represent this cohomology class dz over z, or some multiple of dz over z plus something exact. And what I do is I mandate the integral of dz over z is log of z for some branch of p-adic logarithm. So I pick a branch of p-adic logarithm in advance. And, and then I just piece the integrals together. So let's say I want to integrate from this point P to this point Q. Well, what I can do is I can start here and start walking to other components and integrate on each component. And when I move from one component to another, I'm integrating on an annulus. So I'm just piecing these together, but now here there actually is a path. So there actually will be path dependency. If I were to integrate along a closed path, um, I would get something non I could get something non-trivial. So, and these are very much related to periods of Tate curves. And there's an old paper of uh, Drinfeld and Manin on Schottky curves, which has, explores their periods. All right, so these have periods and they're not equal to the abelian integrals, but we can correct them to the abelian integrals. So um, Mikhail Stoll did so by a local analysis, like basically studying what happened under the Abel Jacobi map. Uh, Besser and Zerbis came up with similar formulas using height pairings. And then um, with uh, Joe Rabinoff and David Zerk Brown using Raynaud uniformization and tropical geometry, we were able to uh, find a formula for abelian integrals in terms of Berkovich Coleman integrals. And I should say that the formula had the form of, like for an abelian integral, it had the form of a Berkovich Coleman integral plus a correction term. Um, and the correction term had the form with some Berkovich Coleman period times a tropical integral or a sum of tropical integrals. And I'll talk about what tropical integrals are, but what they end up being is um, piecewise linear functions when you along on this curve or locally piecewise linear functions like or multi-valued piecewise linear functions on the dual graph all right i'm actually going through my material pretty fast so can some people please ask questions so so your multi-valued what you mean is it's like a linear function on universal cover it's not like it meets up with itself that's right so uh, right it's a piecewise linear function on the universal cover right but the ultimate expression you'll get when you subtract it off will be one valued. Okay, that's not obvious. In, yeah, in fact, you can characterize the function you subtract off by saying it's the unique piecewise linear function that occurs as a tropical integral so that when you subtract it off, it gives you a univalent function. Why is there such a thing? And now there's so much. Oh, uh, oh, because oh, because the periods are such that, like, if you were to, the periods would give you a function from the homology to CP, and there are, and then the tropical integration 
gives you a function also from or for each tropical one form, it gives you a function from this to this and from the homology to CP. And there's enough tropical integrals that you can correct. Great, well, I, one question from chat, which is, uh, uh, what is a Fontaine integral? Is it the same as Colmez? Uh, I've seen the word Fontaine Colmez integrals. So, okay, so, how many Piatic Hodge theorists are in the audience before I start talking? That, that's uh, that's like how many mathematicians does it take to change a light bulb? Yeah. Okay. So the idea of of a of the Colmez integral is is that you want it to be valued not on my original like it's so first it's defined on um, abelian varieties and then pulled back to curves by the Abel Jacobi map. And it's defined on the Tate module of abelian varieties. And somehow what's happening is the following is you construct a period, or sorry, you construct a primitive like you would with usual abelian integration. But then what you do is you, you've got, you view a Tate module as a P power compatible system of points. And then you plug those into this function. And then the function itself uh, obeys like an addition formula as an integral. And then you can have a sensible limit for what this means. So it's sort of like, like here, imagine that this is, has this addition formula. And then this limit makes sense. This limit can be taken in these Fontaine rings. I'm probably lying about something because I forget how to get into one of the, get these in one of these Fontaine rings. But there's ways of making this make sense. I mean, it's, it, these things are pretty cool. I spent a couple of years thinking about them. I have to write up, but I got curious about the different types of piatic integrals, like different notions, like what, like, ser like these integrals, serotate parameters, um, Delina Lucy classes, whatever, um, the extension classes of Alexandru Boyum. Those are all, in some sense, could be measuring non triviality of, a, of an. A, of an abelian variety viewed as an extension of its closed fiber. And I, I know how they're all related. I really need to write it up. But the, these things are super cool. OK, all so right. here, so let me try to extract a question from the chat. Um, OK, so, sure. OK, so the question is, uh, what's the ambiguity in the piatic logarithm, the thing that's analogous to oh, the by z? Yeah, so, sure. Great what's question. The pi? What's the two pi? Like, what is that? Two pi. I? So, so the issue is, how would I define log p? Because if I were to start with a point near the identity, this is a perfectly good. This is a perfectly good power series. So, that, whoops, this is a perfectly good analytic function. But, and so what I can do is I can try factorizing. Um, if I want to take log of something and factorize it as a unit times some power of my uniformizer. And if I have a unit, some power of it is going to be close to one. That's because GM is torsion over FP. GM over FP is torsion. Um, but then I need to know what log of the uniformizer is. And so it's the choice of this thing, that thing. So that's the ambiguity. It isn't an exact analog. Like deep in what I'm gonna be telling you is like, is subtle like, or facts, explicit computations of Tanaki and fundamental groups. 
So there are some subtleties where you get off by two pi i basically because you force yourself to get off by two pi i because you want to have a non-trivial fundamental group for a disk for a punctured disk. So there is the more conventional period is hiding in the background of what I'm telling you. Uh, more questions. So uh, okay, sorry. So so you have this ambiguity, uh, as mm -hmm. you must have an ambiguity, and and that's present in the like the full theory of integration that you're talking about right now. And when you get back to the abelian theory, that's mm -hmm. valued. So the point is that somehow this tropical integration is exactly canceling out this ambiguity. And exactly, could could you just tell me that a little bit more explicitly than saying it is a map from the homology to? Um, oh sure, sure. Okay, I have to jump ahead, but. Oh, so, so I need to talk about these combinatorial integrals and there's an iterated version of them, which is due uh, to Raymond Cheng and myself, but the ideas themselves is due to McCulkin. So there's a notion of a tropical one form on the dual graph. So I'm going to parametrize every edge, treating it as from zero to one. And now my one form is going to be, it's going to restrict to every edge as some multiple of of dt. And I'm going to mandate that this these be harmonic, which means for any vertex, I look at the edges directed away from v, and then the sum of the aes is equal to zero. So these are essentially the same thing as homology classes visualized as flows. And what I can do is I can define, I can integrate these things just by oh and the number of independent such tropical one forms is equal to the rank of h1 of the graph so i can integrate these things in the most naive way i just like you know pass to the universal cover and i just integrate on every edge and stick them together so they're continuous so i end up having enough integrals and now let me let me remember how this goes. So this is the approach with uh, David and Joe, and like what I'll tell you will generalize that, although it's a little bit oblique. Um, so the idea is I want to have my integration be it depends on a path and a one form, and. And so what I want to do is given a one form. Okay. Um, oh, I'm going to let gamma one through gamma G be a basis of one form of the homology of the dual graph. And so I end up having periods like this. So this, these are the berkovich coleman integrals. Now, of course, these are just paths in the dual graph, not paths on the curve. Like you, you could imagine that it might depend on which base point you lift to, but it doesn't. So, so this will have some period. And now given a path, so I'm gonna let delta be a path. I can tropicalize this path so it lies in the dual graph. Now, when I say a path, it's really just a walk between the components of the reduction. So meaning I start at one, a point on one component, then I walk to a point on another component through the annulus connecting them and so on. So the, I'm going to call this the tropicalization of the path. You can actually make this precise in Berkovich's theory. So what you try to do is you start with you want to define this integral, and now I'm going to take take a, like a basis so a to one, a to g of my tropical one forms of the dual graph. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hunt for a linear combination.
like that. So I'm going to try to find something that's univalent from this. And so what I do is I just plug in for delta the closed path, the basis of closed path, and this will fix the AIs and that'll be enough. Cool. And, and can you just remind me again, which terms depend in what way on this formal variable log pi? Oh, sure. Um, well, this will depend on log pi. So this will make, these will end up depending on log pi too. Are, are they, are they multiples of log pi or do they have like non log pi dependence as well? They have non log pi terms and like that this integral will be log pi dependent because it'll be the abelian integral. Yeah, and this was proven by messing around with Raynaud uniformization. Although what I'll tell you will give a generalization of this theorem. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right, so now more questions or I'll talk about iterated integration. Okay, so iterated integration was introduced by Chen motivated by questions in topology and so you'd be, you integrate a whole bunch of one forms against a path. And it's iterated in the sense that I first integrate the first one form, I get a primitive, and imagine I'm doing this on the universal cover, so it makes sense. Then I define the second iterated integral by taking my first primitive times my second one form. Then I take this primitive, multiply by the third one form, and I integrate that. And so that's an iterated integral, and there's a, presumably a piatic version, there is a piatic version of this that comes out of Mignon Kim's non-abeling Shabbati, or it's used in Mignon Kim's non-abeling Shabbati. I think it was, I think Coleman messed around with these um, to define certain regulators. Um, and then the question I have is how do we define this in the bad reduction case? All right, but before I do that, I'm gonna try to reformulate the question. So I'm gonna talk about Besser's approach to piatic integration in the good reduction case. And here I'm going to work in the rigid setting. So the rigid setting means I work over a curve defined over a finite field. And I just pretend like I have a lift over a piatic field and I use Durham cohomology. I use some flavor of overconvergent Durham cohomology. And eventually when I get to the bad reduction case, I'm going to have to use log rigid cohomology, which means I'm going to have, have to wave my hands a lot. And then there's a Tanakian fundamental group. And what it does is it classifies parallel transport operations on iterated extensions of the trivial bundle. So imagine I've, so I'm secretly invoking isocrystals, but we're gonna imagine that I have my curve X naught, I've picked the lift of it over the piatics, and then I have a bundle, which is just an iterated extension of a trivial bundle and equip with a connection, uh, with an integrable connection. And the integration theory is gonna be the parallel transport operation on this bundle equipped with this connection, this connection one form. So really we're solving this differential equation. So, so they're all, okay, so in particular there's zeros below that subdiagonal. So things are kind of, uh, which wasn't in what you were, which was additional information, which was. Oh, if you were to write this out, if you write it line by line, you have these S naught equals zero, which implies S naught is a constant. DS naught is equal to omega one, or DS one is equal to omega one times S naught, which would imply that you're just integrating omega one. And then the next line is that, so you're integrating that. So it, I think it might be in reverse order, but it's. I agree, okay. Yeah, but it's the same, it's the same system of equations. And then, so, and so instead of hunting for an integral, I'm hunting for a point in this Tanaki and fundamental group. And then by anal analyzing the weights on this fundamental group, because this fundamental group has a Frobenius action, you find the unique Frobenius invariant path and then you define integrals that way. And this is an extremely fancy way of doing what I just told you before. All right, so now how do you handle the bad reduction case? Well, you don't have a Frobenius invariant path. 
And now this problem was essentially solved by Volgotsky in his thesis. And his approach was to, is to look at like the group ring of the fundamental group and it carries a monodromy operator. And now there, the Frobenius eigenspace is positive dimensional, but what you can do is you can hunt for paths that, that have good respect, good behavior with respect to the monodromy operator. And somehow it's that the image that they're in the kernel of the monodromy operator as much as they can be. And this isn't precise here, and it's hard to parse in the original paper. Um, so, so I'm gonna give a different approach, which will give Volgotsky's answer, but in a more inevitable way. All right, so I'm gonna start by reformulating Berkovich integration. So that was the integration where we stitched together Frobenius invariant paths. Okay, so there's a specialization map from pi one of the fundamental group to pi one of the graph. And this is formulated in terms of the Tanakian world and it corresponds to pulling back um, 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 local systems to produce um, bundles that are trivial on each component that are that are the trivial bundle on every component, but glued together in some interesting but unipotent way. And then it turns out that the Frobenius invariants of pi one are isomorph is isomorphic to pi one of the dual graph. So that means that any path in the dual graph has a unique Frobenius invariant left. And this gives us Berkovich Coleman integration again. And then the question is, how do I find a single valued integral? And a dimension count shows you that there's really only one way for you to do this. And so what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna pick out a linear combination of paths in the fundamental, the group ring of the fundamental group of the dual graph. When I say linear combination, I mean a formal linear combination of paths. And then I lift it to a Frobenius invariant linear formal combination of paths so that it'll give me um, a single valued integral. All right. And so I just need to find a nice path here. Like somehow I want to find, for any two points, I want to find a path that's unique in some sense. All right. And how do we do it? And somehow, like what I'm about to tell you is just a rephrasing of what I told you before involving the combinatorial integrals. So I've got my tropical one forms. On my dual graph, I can define iterated integrals on the universal cover. These are going to be piecewise polynomial primitives. And then there is a unique path. Um, like a, a unique formal linear combination of paths for which all tropical integrals vanish. And then we lift this path to a Frobenius invariant path. And that lets, gives us a unique single valued integral between any two points. And this integration theory is composable. And this, it, this is somehow a rephrasing of Volgotsky's monodromy uh, condition. Incidentally, this, this, these combinatorial integrals give you a, gives a very explicit description of monodromy. And this agrees with um, the single valued comparison theorems. And this is the unique single valued path that comes out of tropical geometry. If you, like, just as I said here, if you were to try to write down this formula, so it's single value, it would determine the coefficients AI. Here, if you try doing the same thing, this would, and instead of doing single integrals, you do multiple integrals. Instead of doing single periods, you do multiple periods over like a truncated pi one, you would get the, the this unique integral. 
And this has a, this presumably should have application to non-abelian Shabbati, which will be explored. Already work of Betts and Dagra on the non-abelian Coomer map uses these types of arguments. And I've talked to Amnon Besser a bit about this and height pairings. So this is related to some regulator world that I'm not as familiar with. <sighs> By which I mean, thank you. Great, thanks. We can now 